Is this a holiday? What? No, you not being mechanical. You ought not walk upon a laboring day without the sign of your profession. Speak, what trade art thou? Why, sir, a carpenter. Where is thy leather apron and thy rule? What dost thou with thy best apparel on? You, sir, what trade are you? Truly, sir, in respect of a fine workman, I am but, as you would say, a cobbler. But what trade art thou? Answer me directly. A trade, sir, that a hoper may use with a safe conscience, which is indeed, sir, a mender of bad souls. What oh. trade, thou knave, thou naughty knave, what trade? Nay, I beseech you, sir, be not out with me. Yet if you be out, sir, I can mend you. Yeah. Uh, what means thou by that? Mend me, that saucy fellow. Why, sir, cobble you. Ah, thou art a cobbler, art thou? Truly, sir, all that I live by is with the all. Oh. I meddle with no tradesmen's matters, nor women's matters. Yeah. But with all I am indeed, sir, a surgeon to old shoes. When they are in great danger, I recover them. <laughs> as proper men as ever trod upon neat's leather have gone upon my handiwork. But wherefore art not in thy shop today? Why dost thou lead these men about the streets? Truly, sir, to wear out their shoes to get myself into more work. <laughs> But indeed, sir, we make holiday to see Caesar and to rejoice in his trials. Wherefore rejoice? What conquest brings he home? What tributaries follow him to Rome to grace in captive bonds his chariot wheels? You blocks, you stones, you worse than senseless things. Oh, you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome. Knew you not, Pompey? Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls and battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops, your infants in your arms, and there have sat the live long day with patient expectation to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. And when you saw his chariot but appear, have you not made an universal shout that Tiber trembled underneath her banks to hear the replication of your sounds made in her concave shores? And do you now put on your best attire and do you now cull out a holiday? And do you now strew flowers in his way that comes in triumph over Pompey's blood? Be gone! Run to your houses, fall upon your knees, pray to the gods to intermit the plague that needs must light on this ingratitude. Go, go, good countrymen, and for this fault assemble all the poor men of your sort. Draw them to Tiber banks, and weep your tears into the channel, till the lowest stream do kiss the most exalted shores of all. <laughs> See, where their basest metal be not moved, they vanish tongue-tied in their guiltiness. Go you down that way towards the Capitol. This way will I. Disrobe the images if you do find them decked with ceremonies. But may we do so. You know it is the Feast of Lupercal. It is no matter. Let no images be hung with Caesar's trophies. I'll about and drive away the vulgar from the streets. So do you too, where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pitch. Mm -hmm. Who else would soar above the view of men and keep us all in servile fearfulness? Calpurnia, peace home! Caesar speaks! Calpurnia! Here, my lord. Stand you directly in Antonius' way when he doth run his course. Aye. Antonius? Caesar, my lord. Forget not in your speed, Antonius, to touch Calpurnia. For our elders say the baron touched in this holy chase shake off their sterile curse. I shall remember. When Caesar says do this, it is performed. Set on and leave no ceremony out. Caesar! Ha! Who calls? Speak every noise, be still. Peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shriller than all the music, cries Caesar. Speak. Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of March. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him. 
Pass. Will you go see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder Cassius your desires. I'll leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself which give some soil, perhaps, to my behaviours. But let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number Cassius be you one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus, with himself at war, forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? <laughs> no, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other thing. It is just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. And be not jealous on me, gentle Brutus, were I a common laughter, or did use to stale with ordinary oaths my love to every new protester. If you know that I do fawn on men and hug them hard and after scandal them, or if you know that I profess myself in banqueting to all the rout, then... Hold me dangerous. What means this shouting? I do fear that people choose Caesar for their king. Aye. Do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me, as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self I had as lief not be, as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar. So were you. We both are fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Durst thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive, the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but nod on him. He had a fever when he was in Spain, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. Tis true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye whose bend doth all the world did lose his luster. I did hear him groan, 
Aye, and that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write his speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink, Titinius. As a sick girl. Ye gods, it doth amaze me a man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. My man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we pet him and walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men that some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together. Yours is as fair a name. Sound them. It doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them. It is as heavy. Conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the names of all the gods at once, upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he is grown so great? Age, thou art shamed. Rome... Thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. When went there by an age since the great flood, but it was famed with more than with one man? When could they say, till now, that talked of Rome, that her wide walks encompassed but one man? Now is it Rome indeed, and room enough, when there is in it but one only man? Oh, you and I have heard our father say there was a Brutus once that would have booked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. That you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times I shall recount hereafter. For this present, I would not, so with love I might entreat you, be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear, and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions as this time is like to lay upon us. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. The games are done, and Caesar is returning. As they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, <laughs> tell you what has preceded worthy note today. I will do so. But look you, Cassius. The angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden train. Calpurnia's cheek is pale. And Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the Capitol being crossed in conference by some senators. Casca will tell us what the matter is. Antonius, Caesar, let me have men about me that are fat. Sleek-headed men and such as sleeper nights. Beyond Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He is a noble Roman and well given. Would he were fatter? But I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. He reads much. He is a great observer and he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore are they very dangerous. I'd rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf, and tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. You pulled me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? Aye, Casca. Tell us what hath chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what had chanced. Why, there was a crown offered him. 
and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand, thus, and then the people fell a-shouting. What was the second noise for? Why, for that, too. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that, too. Was the crown offered him thrice? I marry was and he put it by thrice, every time gentler than other, and at every putting by, mine honest neighbours shouted. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. Huh. I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown. Yet was not a crown, neither. It was one of these coronets. And as I told you, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it to him again. Then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time. He put it the third time by, and still as he refused it, the rabblement hooted and clapped their chopped hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps, and after such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it had almost choked Caesar, for he swooned it and fell down at it. And for my own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. But soft, I pray you, what did Caesar swoon? He fell down in the marketplace and foamed at mouth and was speechless. It is very like he hath the falling sickness. No, Caesar hath it not. But you and I and honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that. But I am sure Caesar fell down. If the tag rag people did not clap him and hiss him, according as he pleased and displeased them, as they used to do the players in the theatre, I am no true man. What said he when he came unto himself? Marry. Before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me up his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. And I had been a man of any occupation. If I would not have taken him at a word, I would I might go to hell among the rogues. And so he fell. When he came to himself again, he said if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, Alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. <laughs> and after that, he came thus sad away? Aye. Did Cicero say anything? Aye. He spoke Greek. To what effect? Nay, and I tell you that, I'll never look you in the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. For my own part, it was Greek to me. <laughs> I could tell you more news, too. Marullus and Flavius, for pulling scarfs off Caesar's images, are put to silence. Fare you well. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I'm promised forth. Uh, will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive, and your mind hold, and your dinner worth eating. Good. I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. What a blunt fellow is this grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. So is he now in execution of any bold or noble enterprise, however he puts on this tardy form. This rudeness is a source to his good wit, which gives men stomach to digest his words with better appetite. And so it is. For this time, I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you, or if you will, come home to me and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, Brutus, thou art noble. Yet I see thy honourable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes. For who so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humour me. I will this night, in several hands, in at his windows throw, as if they came from several citizens, writings, all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him. Or worse days endure.
Good even, Casca. Brought you Caesar home. Why are you breathless? And why stare you so? And not you moved when all the sway of earth shakes like a thing unfirm? Oh, Cicero. I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have writhed the knotty oaks, and I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam to be exalted with the threatening clouds. But never till tonight, never till now did I go through a tempest dropping fire. Either there is a civil strife in heaven, or else the world, too saucy with the gods, incenses them to send destruction. Why saw you anything more wonderful? <laughs> A common slave, you know him well by sight, held up his left hand, which did flame and burn like twenty torches joined, and yet his hand, not sensible of fire, remained unscorched. Besides, I had not since put up my sword against the capital, I met a lion, who glazed upon me and went surly by without annoying me. And there were drawn upon a heap a hundred ghastly women, transformed with their fear, who swore they saw men, all in fire, walk up and down the streets. And yesterday, the bird of night did sit, even at noonday, upon the marketplace, hooting and shrieking. When these prodigies do so conjointly meet, let not men say, these are their reasons, they are natural. For I believe they are portentous things unto the climate that they point upon. Indeed, it is a strange disposed time. But men may construe things after their fashion, <laughs> clean from the purpose of the things themselves. Come Caesar to the capital tomorrow. He does. For he did bid Antonius send word to you he would be there tomorrow. Good night then, Casca. This disturbed sky is not to walk in. Farewell, Cicero. Who's there? A Roman. Casca, by your voice. Your ear is good. Cassius, what night is this? Very pleasing night to honest men. Whoever knew the heavens menace so? Those that have known the earth so full of faults. For my part, I have walked about the streets, submitting me unto the perilous night, and thus unbraced Casca, as you see, have bared my bosom to the thunderstone. And when the cross-blue lightning seemed to open the breast of heaven, I did present myself even in the aim and very flash of it. But wherefore did you so much tempt the heavens? It is the part of men to fear and tremble when the most mighty gods, by tokens, send such dreadful heralds to astonish us. You are dull, Casca, and those sparks of life that should be in a Roman you do want, or else you use not... <laughs> You look pale, and gaze, and put on fear, and cast yourself in wonder, to see the strange impatience of the heavens. But if you would consider the true cause, why all these fires, why all these gliding ghosts, why birds and beasts from quality and kind, why old men, fools, and children calculate, why all these things change from their ordinance, their natures, and preformed faculties, to monstrous quality, why... You shall find that heaven hath infused them with these spirits to make them instruments of fear and warning unto some monstrous state. Now could I, Casca, name to thee a man most like this dreadful night that thunders, lightens, opens graves and roars as doth the lion in the Capitol? A man no mightier than thyself or me in personal action, yet prodigious grown and fearful as these strange eruptions are. Tis Caesar that you mean. Is it not, Cassius? Let it be who it is. For Romans now have thews and limbs like to their ancestors. But woe the while, our fathers' minds are dead, and we are governed with our mother's spirits. Our yoke and sufferance show us womanish. Indeed. They say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king, and he shall wear his crown by sea and land in every place save here in Italy. I know where I will wear this dagger then. Cassius from bondage will deliver Cassius. Therein, ye gods, you make the weak most strong. Therein, ye gods, you tyrants do defeat. Nor stony tower, nor walls of beaten brass, nor airless dungeon, nor strong links of iron can be retentive to the strength of spirit. But life, being weary of these worldly bars, never lacks power to dismiss itself. If I know this, know all the world besides. That part of tyranny that I do bear, I can shake off at pleasure. So can I. So every bondman in his own hand bears the power to cancel his captivity. And why should Caesar be a tyrant, then? Poor man. I know he would not be a wolf, but that he sees the Romans are but sheep. He were no lion, were not Romans' hinds. Those that with haste will make a mighty fire begin it with weak straws. What trash is Rome? What rubbish and what awful when it serves for the base matter to illuminate so vile a thing as Caesar. Oh, but, oh, grief... 
where hast thou led me? I perhaps speak this before a willing bondman. Then I know my answer must be made. But I am armed, and dangers are to me indifferent. You speak to Casca, and to such a man that is no fleering telltale. Hold my hand. It be factious for redress of all these griefs, and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. There's a bargain made. Now know you, Casca, I have moved already some certain of the noblest-minded Romans to undergo with me an enterprise of honourable dangerous consequence, and I do know, by this they stay for me in Pompey's porch, for now, this fearful night, there is no stir or walking in the streets, and the complexion of the element is feverish like the work we have in hand, most bloody, fiery, and most terrible. Stand close a while, for here comes one in haste. Tis sinner, I do know him by his gate. He is a friend. Sinner! Where haste you so? To find out you. Who's that? Metella Simba? No, it is Casca, one incorporate to our attempts. Am I not stayed for, sinner? I am glad, aunt. What a fearful night is this, as two or three of us have seen strange sights. Am I not stayed for? Tell me. Yes, you are. Oh, Cassius, if you could but win the noble Brutus to our party. Are you content? Good sinner, take this paper, and look you lay it in the praetor's chair where Brutus may but find it, and throw this in at his window. Set this up with wax upon old Brutus' statue. All this done, repair to Pompey's porch where you shall find us. Is Decius Brutus and Trebonius there? All but Metellus Simba, and he's gone to seek you at your house. Well, I will hie and so bestow these papers as you badly. That done, repair to Pompey's theatre. Come, Casca. You and I will yet ere day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already, and the man in tire upon the next encounter yields him ours. Oh, he sits high in all the people's hearts, and that which would appear offence in us, his countenance, like richest alchemy, will change to virtue and to worthiness. Him and his worth, and our great need of him, you have right well conceited. Let us go, for it is after midnight, and ere day we will awake him and be sure of him. Lucius, ho! I cannot by the progress of the stars give guess how near today. Lucius, I say! <laughs> I would it were my fault to sleep so soundly. When, Lucius, when? Awake, I say, what Lucius? Cold you, my lord. Get me a taper in my study, Lucius. When it is lighted, come and call me here. I will, my lord. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves wary walking. Crown him. That. And then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason. But... It is a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may. Then lest he may prevent... And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is fashioned thus, that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities, and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which, hatched, would as his kind grow mischievous, and kill him in the shell. The taper burneth in your closet, sir. 
searching the window for a flint, I found this paper, thus sealed up, and I'm sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get you to bed again. It is not day. Is not tomorrow, boy, the Ides of March? I know not, sir. Look in the calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. The exhalations whizzing in the air give so much light that I may read by them. Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake and see thyself. Shall roam, etc. Speak, strike, redress. Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake. Such instigations have been often dropped where I have took them up. Shall roam, etc. Thus must I piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's oar? What? Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarquin drive when he was called a king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I entreated to speak and strike? O oh, Rome, I make thee promise, if the redress will follow, thou receivest thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. Sir, march is wasted fifteen days. Tis good. Go to the gate, somebody knocks. Since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council, and the state of a man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. Sir, it is your brother Cassius at the door who doth the desire to see you. Is he alone? No, sir, there are more with him. Do you know them? No, sir. Their hats are plucked about their ears, and half their faces buried in their cloaks, that by no means I may discover them by any mark of favour. Let them enter. They are the faction. Oh, conspiracy. Shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night when evils are most free? Oh, then by day, where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monstrous visage? Seek none, conspiracy. Hide it in smiles and affability. For if thou path thy native semblance on, not Erebus itself were dim enough to hide thee from prevention. I think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I have been up this hour awake all night. Know I these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them. And no man here but honours you, and every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble Roman bears of you. This is Trebonius. He is welcome hither. This Decius Brutus. He is welcome too. This Casca. Yes, this Sinner. And this Metellus Simba. They are all welcome. What watchful cares do interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? Shall I entreat a word? <clears throat> here lies the east. Doth not the day break here? No. Oh, pardon, sir, it doth. And yon grey lines that fret the clouds are messengers of death. You shall confess that you are both deceived. Here... As I point my sword, the sun arises, which is a great way growing on the south, weighing the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher toward the north, he first presents his fire, and the high east stands as the capital. Directly here. Give me your hands all over, <sighs> one by one. And let us swear our resolution. <laughs> no, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse... If these be motives weak, break off betimes and every man hence to his idle bed. 
So let high-sighted tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I am sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then, countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not palter? And what other oath than honesty? To honesty engaged that this shall be, or we will fall for it. Swear priests and cowards and men quarterless, old feeble carrions and such suffering souls that welcome wrongs. Unto bad causes swear such creatures as men doubt, but do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits to think that or our cause or our performance did need an oath, when every drop of blood that every Roman bears and nobly bears is guilty of a several bastardy. If he do break the smallest particle of any promise that hath passed from him. But what of Cicero? Shall we sound him? I think he will stand very strong with us. Let us not leave him out. No, by no means. Oh, let us have him. For his silver hairs will purchase us a good opinion and buy men's voices to commend our deeds. It shall be said his judgment ruled our hands. Our youths and wildness shall no whit appear, but all be buried in his gravity. Oh, name him not. Let us not break with him. For he will never follow anything that other men begin. Then leave him out. Indeed. He is not fit. Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Decius, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. No. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver, and you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all, which to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off. And then hack the limbs, like wrath in death and envy afterwards. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let's be sacrificers, but not butchers, Caius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar. And in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, that we then could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. But, alas... Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds. And let our hearts, as subtle masters do, stir up their servants to an act of rage and after seem to chide them. This shall make our purpose necessary and not envious which so appearing to the common eyes we shall be called purgers, not murderers. And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Yet I fear him, for in the engrafted love he bears to Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself take thought and die for Caesar. And that were much he should. For he is given to sports, to wildness, and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh at this hereafter. Peace, count the clock. The clock hath stricken three. It is time to part. But it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth today or no. For he is superstitious grown of late, quite from the main opinion he held once of fantasy, of dreams and ceremonies. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night, and the persuasion of his augurers may hold him from the Capitol today. Never fear that. If he be so resolved, I can sway him. For he loves to hear that unicorns may be betrayed with trees and <laughs> <laughs> bears with glasses, elephants with holes, lions with toils, and men with flatterers. But when I tell him he hates flatterers, he says he does, being then most flattered. Let me work, <laughs> for I can give his humor the true bent, and I will bring him to the capital. Nay, we will all of us be there to fetch him. By the eight hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost, and fail not then. 
Caius Ligarius doth bear Caesar hard, who rated him for speaking well of Pompey. I wonder none of you have thought of him. Oh. Now, good Metellus, go along by him. He loves me well, and I have given him reasons. Send him but hither, and I'll fashion him. The morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus. And friends, disperse yourselves. But all remember what you have said, and show yourselves true Romans. Good gentlemen, look fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. And so good morrow to you, everyone. Boy, Lucius. Fast asleep. It is no matter. Enjoy the honey heavy dew of slumber. Thou hast no figures nor no fantasies which busy care draws in the brains of men. Therefore thou sleepst so sound. Brutus, my lord. Portia, what mean you? Wherefore rise you now? It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw, cold morning. Nor for yours neither. You have ungently brought a stove for my bed. And yesternight at supper, you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further. Then you scratched your head and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not, but with an angry waft of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience, which seemed too much enkindled, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humour, which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, and could it work so much upon your shape as it has much prevailed on your condition. I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise. Were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dank morning? What is Brutus sick? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unperjured air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus. You have some sick offence within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me yourself, your half, why you are heavy. And what men tonight have had resort to you, for you have been some sick or seven, who did hide their faces even from darkness. Kneel not, gentle Portia. I should not need if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself but, as it were, in sort or limitation? To keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus Harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honourable wife, as dear to me as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then should I know this secret. I grant I am a woman but with all a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman well reputed, 
Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience and not my husband's secrets? Oh, ye gods. Render me worthy of this noble wife. Hark. Hark. One knocks, Portia. Go in a while, and by and by thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, or the character of my sad brows. Leave me with haste. Lucius, who's that knocks? Here is a sick man that would speak with you. Oh, Caius Ligarius, that Metellus spake of. Boy, stand aside. Caius Ligarius, how? Vouchsafe good morrow from a feeble tongue. Oh, what a time have you chose out, brave Caius, to wear a kerchief. Would you were not sick? I am not sick, if Brutus have in hand any exploit worthy the name of honor. Such an exploit have I in hand, Ligarius, had you a healthful ear to hear of it. By all the gods that Romans bow before, I hear discard my sickness. <laughs> Soul of Rome, brave son derived from honorable loins, thou, like an exorcist, hast conjured up my mortified spirit. Now bid me run, and I will strive with things impossible. Yea, get the better of them. What's to do? A piece of work that will make sick men whole. But are not some whole that we must make sick? That must we also. What it is, my Caius, I shall unfold to thee as we are going to whom it must be done. Set on your foot, and with a heart new-fired I follow you. To do I know not what, but it sufficeth that Brutus leads me on. Follow me, then. have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help! Ho! Oh, they murder Caesar! Who's within? My lord. Go, bid the priests do present sacrifice and bring me their opinions of success. I will, my lord. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth. The things that threaten me ne'er look but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar, I never stood on the ceremonies. Yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sight seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. <sighs> Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and right form of war, which <laughs> trizzled blood upon the capital. <sighs> the noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. <gasps> oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do Fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come. 
when it will come. What say the augurers? They would not have you stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. <gasps> the gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart if he should stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I the elder and more terrible. And Caesar shall go forth. Oh, alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate house, and he shall say you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. Mark Antony shall say I am not well, and for thy humor I will stay at home. Oh. Caesar, all hail. Here's Decius Brutus. He shall tell them so. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate House. And you are come in very happy time to bear my greeting to the Senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false, and that I dare not false, I will not come today. Tell them so, Decius. Say he is sick. Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched mine arms so far to be afeard to tell greybeards the truth? Decius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But... For your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statue, which, like a fountain with an hundred spouts, did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warnings and portents and evil imminent, and on her knee had begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. <sighs> it was a vision. Fair and fortunate. Your statue, spouting blood in many pipes in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood, and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This, by Calpurnia's dream, is signified. And this way have you well expounded it. <laughs> I have, when you have heard what I can say. And know it now. The Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, Break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. <sighs> if Caesar hide himself... Shall they not whisper, no, Caesar is afraid? <sighs> Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to your proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. <laughs> How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia. I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. <laughs> and look where Publius is come to fetch me. Good morrow, Caesar. Welcome, Publius. <laughs> what, Brutus? Caesar. You stirred so early, too. Good morrow, Casca. Caius Ligarius. <laughs> Caesar was ne'er so much your enemy as that same ague which hath made you lean. <laughs> what is the clock? Caesar to struck an eight. I thank you for your pains and courtesy. <laughs> See, Antony, the that revels long and nights is notwithstanding up. <laughs> Good morrow, Antony. And so to most noble Caesar. <clears throat> now bid them prepare within. I am to blame to be thus waited for. Now, sinner! Now, Metellus! What, Trebonius? 
<laughs> I have an hour's talk in store for you. Remember that you call on me today. Be near me that I may remember you. Caesar, I will. <laughs> and so near will I be that your best friend shall wish I had been further. Good friends, go in and taste some wine with me, and we, like friends, will straightway go together. <laughs> that every like is not the same, O oh Caesar, the heart of Brutus earns to think upon. Caesar, beware of Brutus. Take heed of Cassius. Come not near Casca. Have an eye to Cinna. Trust not Trebonius. Mark well Metellus' symbol. Theseus Brutus loves thee not. Thou hast wronged Caius Ligarius. There is but one mind in all these men, and it is bent against Caesar. If thou beest not immortal, look about you. Security gives way to conspiracy. The mighty gods defend thee. Thy lover, Artemidorus. Here will I stand till Caesar pass along, and as a suitor will I give him this. My heart laments that virtue cannot live out of the teeth of emulation. If thou read this, O Caesar, thou mayst live. If not, the fates with traitors to contrive. Me, but get thee gone. Why dost thou stay? To know my errand, madam. I would have had thee there and here again, ere I can tell thee what thou shouldst do there. O Constancy, be strong upon my side. Set a huge mountain between my heart and tongue. I have a man's mind, but a woman's might. How hard it is for women to keep counsel. Art thou here yet? Madam, what should I do? Run to the capital and nothing else? And so return to you and nothing else? Yes. Bring me word, boy, if thy lord look well. For he went sickly forth. And take good note what Caesar doth, what suitors press to him. Hark, boy, what noise is that? I hear none, madam. Prithee, listen well. I heard a bustling rumour like a fray. And the wind brings it from the capital. Sooth, madam, I hear nothing. Come here, the fellow. <laughs> Which way hast thou been? At mine own house, good lady. What is the clock? About the ninth hour, lady. Is Caesar yet gone to the capital? Madam, not yet. I could just take my stand to see him pass on to the capital. Thou hast some suit to Caesar, hast thou not? That I have, lady. If it will please Caesar to be so good to Caesar as to hear me, I shall beseech him to befriend himself. Why knowst thou any harms intended towards him? None that I know will be much that I fear may chance. Good morrow to you. Here the street is narrow. The throng that follows Caesar at the heels of senators of praetors common suitors will crowd a feeble man almost to death. I'll get me to a place more void, and there speak to great Caesar as he comes along. I must go in. I me how weak a thing the heart of woman is. O oh, Brutus, the heavens speed thee in thine enterprise. Sure, the boy heard me. Brutus hath a suit that Caesar will not grant. Oh, I grow faint. Run, Lucius, and commend me to my lord. Say I am merry. Come to me again, and bring me word what he doth say to thee. Come. I, Caesar, but not gone. Hail, Caesar. 
Read this schedule. Trebonia stuff desire you to uh, read at your best leisure. This is humble suit. Oh, Caesar, read mine first. For mine's a suit that touches Caesar nearer. Read it, great Caesar. What touches us ourselves shall be last, sir. Delay not, Caesar. Read it instantly. What, is the fellow mad? No, give me. I'd urge you your petitions in the street. Come to the Capitol. I wish your enterprise today may thrive. What enterprise, Papilius? Very well. What said Papilius Lena? We wish today our enterprise might thrive. I fear our purpose is discovered. Look how he makes to Caesar. Mark him. Casca, be sudden, for we fear prevention. Brutus, what shall be done? If this be known, Cassius or Caesar never shall turn back, for I will slay myself. Cassius, be constant. Papilius Lena speaks not of our purposes, for look, he smiles. And Caesar doth not change. Trebonius knows his time. For look you, Brutus, he draws Mark Antony out of the way. Where is Metellus Simba? Let him go and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Casca, you are the first to raise your hand. Aye. Are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his Senate must redress? Most high, most mighty, and most puissant Caesar. Metellus Simba throws before thy seat an humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simba! These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn preordinance and first decree into the lane of children. Be not fond to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed from the true quality with that which melteth fools. I mean sweet words, low crooked curtsies, and base spaniel fawning. Thy brother by decree is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will he be satisfied. Is there no voice more worthy than my own? to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother. I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simba may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon, as low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simba. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They are all fire, and every one doth shine. But there's but one in all doth hold his place. So in the world, is furnished well with men, and men are flesh and blood and apprehensive, yet in the number I do know but one that unassailable holds on his rank, unshaked of motion. And that I am he, let me a little show it even in this, that I was constant Simba should be banished, and constant to remain to keep him so. Oh, Caesar. Hence, but thou lift up Olympus. Great Caesar. Doth not Brutus bootless kneel. Eat hands for me. Do, Brute. Then, thou, Caesar. <laughs> Liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. Run hence, proclaim, cry it about the streets. Come to the common pulpits and cry out, liberty, freedom, and enfranchisement. People and senators, be not affrighted. Fly not, stand still. Ambition's debt is paid. Go to the pulpit, Brutus. And Cassius, too. Where's Publius? Here, 
quite confounded with this mutiny. Stand fast together, lest some friend of Caesar should it's chance... Talk not of standing. Publius, good cheer. There is no harm intended to your person or to no Roman else. So tell them, Publius. And leave us, Publius. Lest that the people rushing on us should do your age some mischief. Do so, and let no man abide this deed but we the doers. Where is Antony? Fled to his house amazed. Men, wives, and children stare, cry out, and run as it were doomsday. Fates, we will know your pleasures. That we shall die, we know. Tis but the time and drawing days out that men stand upon. Why, he that cuts off twenty years of life cuts off so many years of fearing death. Grant that, and then is death a benefit. So are we Caesar's friends that have abridged his time of fearing death. Stoop, Romans. Stoop. And let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords. Oh. Then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons o'er our heads, let's all cry peace, freedom, and liberty. Stoop then and wash. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport that now on Pompey's basis lies along no worthier than the dust? So oft as that shall be, so often shall the knot of us be called... The men that gave their country liberty. What? Shall we forth? Aye, every man away. Brutus shall lead, and we will grace his heels with the most boldest and best hearts of Rome. Soft, who comes here? A friend of Antony's. Thus, Brutus, did my master bid me kneel. Thus did Mark Antony bid me fall down. And being prostrate, thus he bade me say. Brutus is noble, wise, valiant, and honest. Caesar was mighty, bold, royal, and loving. Say, I love Brutus, and I honor him. Say, I feared Caesar, honored him, and loved him. If Brutus will vouchsafe that Antony may safely come to him and be resolved how Caesar hath deserved to lie in death, Mark Antony shall not love Caesar dead so well as Brutus living, but will follow the fortunes and affairs of noble Brutus, thorough the hazards of this untrod state with all true faith. So says my master Antony. Thy master is a wise and valiant Roman. I never thought him worse. Tell him, so please him come unto this place, he shall be satisfied, and by my honour depart untouched. I'll fetch him presently. I know that we shall have him well to friend. I wish we may, but yet have I a mind that fears him much, and my misgivings still fall shrewdly to the purpose. But here comes Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. Almighty Caesar. Dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils, shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death's hour nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. I do beseech ye, if you bear me hard, now whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke fulfill your pleasure. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so, no mean of death, as here, by Caesar and by you, cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. O oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. Though now we must appear bloody and cruel, as by our hands and this our present act you see we do, yet see you but our hands, and this the bleeding business they have done. Our hearts you see not. They are pitiful. And pity to the general wrong of Rome, as fire drives out fire, so pity, pity, hath done this deed on Caesar. For your part, to you our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony. Our arms in strength of malice and our hearts of brother's temper do receive you in with all kind love, good thoughts, and reverence. Your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude, beside themselves with fear. And then we will deliver you the cause why I that did love Caesar when I struck him have thus proceeded. 
I doubt not of your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. First, Marcus Brutus, will I shake with you. Next, Caius Cassius, do I take your hand. Now, Decius Brutus, yours. Now yours, Metellus. Yours, Sinner. And my valiant Casca, yours. Though last, not least in love, yours, good Trebonius. Gentlemen all, alas, what shall I say? My credit now stands on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must conceit me, either a coward or a flatterer. That I did love thee, Caesar. Oh, tis true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Antony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes? Most noble in the presence of thy course. Had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemies. Pardon me, Julius. Here wast thou bade, brave heart. Here didst thou fall. And here thy hunters stand, signed in thy spoil and crimsoned in thy leaf. Oh, world, thou wast the forest to this heart, and this indeed, O oh world, the heart of thee. How like a deer, stroken by many princes, dost thou here lie. Mark Antony. Pardon me, Caius Cassius. The enemies of Caesar shall say this. Then in a friend it is cold modesty. I blame you not for praising Caesar so. But what compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in number of our friends, or shall we on, and not depend on you? Therefore I took your hands, but was indeed swayed from the point by looking down on Caesar. Friends am I with you all, and love you all, upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else were this a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And am, moreover, suitor that I may produce his body to the marketplace. And in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon. I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I will protest he speaks by leave and by permission. And that we are contented, Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. <laughs> it shall advantage more than do us wrong. I know not what may fall. I like it not. Mark Antony. Here. Take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar. And say so you do it by our permission, else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going after my speech is ended. Be it so. I do desire no more. Prepare the body, then, and follow us. Pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. <laughs> thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times.
Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do ope their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar, that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds, and Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, with Arte by his side come hot from hell, shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry, Havoc, and let slip the dogs of war. That this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. You serve Octavius Caesar, do you not? I do, Mark Antony. Caesar did write for him to come to Rome? He did receive his letters and is coming. And bid me say to you, by word of mouth. Oh, Caesar. Thy heart is big. Get thee apart and weep. Passion, I see, is catching. For mine eyes, seeing those beads of sorrow stand in thine, began to water. Is thy master coming? He lies tonight, within seven leagues of Rome. Post back with speed and tell him what hath chanced. Here is a morning Rome, a dangerous Rome, no Rome of safety for Octavius yet. Hi hence and tell him so. Yet stay a while. Thou shalt not back till I have borne this course into the marketplace. <laughs> There shall I try in my oration how the people take the cruel issue of these bloody men. According to the which thou shalt discourse to young Octavius of the state of things. <sighs> Lend me your hand. <laughs> Go you into the other street and part the numbers. Yeah. Those that will hear me speak, let them stay here. Those that will follow Cassius, go with him, and public reasons shall be rendered of Caesar's death. I will hear Brutus speak. I will hear Cassius and compare their reasons when severally we hear them render it. wisdom, and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus' love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more! Had you rather 
Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any, speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any, speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so vile that will not love his country? If any, speak, for him have I offended. I pause for a reply. No, no. Brutus! No. No. Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the Capitol. His glory not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses enforced for which he suffered death. Here comes his body. Mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the Commonwealth, as which of you shall not? With this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. Live, Brutus, live! Yeah. Live! Yeah. live. better part shall be crowned in Brutus. shall bring him to his house with shouts and clamors. Yes! Yes! My countrymen! Be silent! Brutus, speak! Be so! Good countrymen, let me depart alone, and for my sake stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse, and grace his speech tending to Caesar's glories which Mark Antony by our permission is allowed to make. I do entreat you, not a man depart save I alone, till Antony have spoke. Stay ho! Let us hear Mark Antony! Let him go up into the public chair. We'll hear him. Noble Antony, go up! For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you! What does he say of Brutus? He says for Brutus' sake he finds himself beholding to us all. To best he speak no harm of Brutus here. This Caesar was a tyrant! Yes, sir, sir. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. We are. Peace! Let us hear what Antony can say! You gentle Romans! Peace, oh! No. Let us hear him! Let us hear him! Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears! I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. 
he hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Uh, bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. Thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Mark ye his words. He would not take the crown, therefore it is certain he was not ambitious. If he found so, some will dare abide it. Oh, so his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Romans! Now mark him! He begins again to speak. But yesterday... The word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Gentle friends, I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood. You are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? Read the will! Yeah. We'll hear it, Antony! You shall read us the will! Caesar's will! Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors! Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend, and will you give me leave? Stand round. Stand from the hearse. Stand from the body. Look for Antony, most noble Antony. Nay, press not so upon me. Stand far off. 
If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent that day he overcame the Nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all, for when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself, marred as you see with traitors. Oh, piteous spectacle. Noble Caesar. A woeful day. Traitors. Villains. Oh, most bloody sight. We will be revenge. 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 We will be revenge. Stay, countrymen. Sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not that made them do it. They are wise and honorable and will, no doubt, with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that love my friend. Aye. And that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither writ, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. We are mutiny! Ah! Seek the conspiracy. Yes. Yet hear me, countrymen. Yet hear me speak. Yes. Hear Antony, most noble Antony. Why, friends, you go to do you know not what? Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then, you have forgot the will I told you of. <laughs> Here is the will. And under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. Oh, most noble Caesar, we revenge his death! Oh, 
royal Caesar. Ah. Hear me with patience. Ah, peace, 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 peace. Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards on this side Tiber. He hath left them you and to your heirs forever. Common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? Never! Away. Never! Never! Away. Away. Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. How now, fellow? Sir, Octavius is already come to Rome. Where is he? He and Lepidus are at Caesar's house. And thither will I straight to visit him. He comes upon a wish. Fortune is merry, and in this mood will give us anything. I heard him say Brutus and Cassius are rid like madmen through the gates of Rome. Belike they had some notice of the people, how I had moved them. Bring me to Octavius. I dreamt tonight that I did feast with Caesar, and things unluckily charge my fantasy. I have no will to wander forth of doors, yet something leads me forth. What is your name? Whither are you going? Where do you dwell? Are you a married man or a bachelor? Answer every man directly. Aye, and briefly. Aye, and wisely. Aye, and truly you were best. What is my name? Whither am I going? Where do I dwell? Am I a married man or a bachelor? Then to answer every man directly and briefly, wisely and truly, wisely, I say, I am a bachelor. That's as much as to say they are fools that marry. You'll bear me a bang for that, I fear. Proceed directly. Directly, I am going to Caesar's funeral. As a friend or an enemy? As a friend. That matter is answered directly. For your dwelling, briefly. Briefly, I dwell by the capital. Your name, sir, truly. Truly, my name is Sinner. <gasps> Tear him to pieces. <clears throat> He's a conspirator. I am Sinner the Poet. I am Sinner the Poet. Tear him for his bad verses. Tear him for his bad verses. I am not Sinner the Conspirator. It is no matter. His name's Sinner. Pluck but his name out of his heart and turn him going. Tear him. Tear him! <laughs> Come, Brands! Ho! Oh, Fire, Brands! The Brutus! The Cassius! One more! And some the Cassius! The Lagoria! Away, go! These many, then, shall die. Their names are pricked. Your brother, too, must die. Consent you, Lepidus. I do consent. Prick him down, Antony. Upon condition, Publius shall not live, who is your sister's son, Mark Antony. He shall not live. Look, with a spot I damn him. But Lepidus, go you to Caesar's house, fetch the will hither, and we shall determine how to cut off some charge in legacies. What shall I find you here? Or here or at the capital. <laughs> Oh, this is a slight, unmeritable man. Meet to be sent on errands. Is it fit the threefold world divided he should stand one of the three to share it? So you thought him and took his voice who should be pricked to die in our black sentence and prescription. Oh, Octavius, I have seen more days than you, and though we lay these honours on this 
man to ease ourselves of divers slanderous loads, he shall but bear them as the ass bears gold, to groan and sweat under the business, either led or driven as we point the way, and having brought our treasure where we will, then take we down his load and turn him off like to the empty ass, to shake his ears and graze in commons. You may do your will, but he's a tried and valiant soldier. So is my horse, Octavius, and for that I do appoint him store of provender. It is a creature that I teach to fight, to wind, to stop, to run directly on. His corporal motion governed by my spirit, and in some taste is lepidus but so. He must be taught and trained and bid go forth. A barren-spirited fellow, one that feeds on objects, arts, and imitations, which out of use and staled by other men, begin his fashion. Oh, do not talk of him but as a property. And now, Octavius, listen great things. Brutus and Cassius are levying powers. We must straight make head. Therefore let our alliance be combined, our best friends made, our means stretched, and let us presently go sit in council how covert matters may be best disclosed, and open perils surest answered. Let us do so, for we are at the stake and bade about with many enemies, and some that smile have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischiefs. Lucilius, is Cassius near? He is at hand, and Pindarus is come to do you salutation from his master. He greets me well. Your master, Pindarus, in his own change or by ill offices, hath given me some worthy cause to wish things done undone. But if he be at hand, I shall be satisfied. I do not doubt but that my noble master will appear such as he is, full of regard and honor. He is not doubted. A word, Lucilius. How he received you, let me be resolved. With courtesy and with respect enough, but not with such familiar instances, nor with such free and friendly conference as he hath used of old. Thou hast described a hot friend cooling. Mm. Ever note, Lucilius, when love begins to sicken and decay, it useth an enforced ceremony. There are no tricks in plain and simple faith. But hollow men, like horses hot at hand, make gallant show and promise of their mettle. But when they should endure the bloody spur, they fall their crests, and like deceitful jades sink in the trial. Comes his army on? They mean this night in Sardis to be quartered. The greater part, the horse in general, are come with Cassius. Hark, he has arrived. March gently on to meet him. Stand ho! Stand ho! Speak the word along! Stand! 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 Most noble brother, you have done me wrong. Judge me, you gods. Wrong I mine enemies? And if not so, how should I wrong a brother? Brutus, this sober form of yours hides wrongs, and when you do them... Cassius, be content. Speak your grief softly. I do know you well. Before the eyes of both our armies here, which should perceive nothing but love from us, let us not wrangle. Bid them move away. Then in my tent, Cassius, enlarge your griefs. I will give you audience. Pindarus, bid our commanders lead their charges off a little from this ground. Lucilius, do you the like, and let no man come to our tent till we have done our conference. Let Lucius and Titinius guard our door. That you have wronged me doth appear in this. You have condemned and noted Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians, where in my letters, praying on his side, because I knew the man, was slighted off. You wronged yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offence should bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm, to sell and march your offices for gold to undeservers. I, an itching palm? You know that you are Brutus that speaks this, or by the gods, this speech were else your last. The name of Cassius honors this corruption, and chastisement doth therefore hide his head. Chastisement? Remember March. 
The Ides of March, remember. Did not great Julius bleed for justice sake? What villain touched his body that did stab and not for justice? What? Shall one of us that struck the foremost man of all this world but for supporting robbers, shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes, and sell the mighty space of our large honours for so much trash as may be grasped thus? I had rather be a dog and bathe the moon than such a Roman. Brutus, bait not me. I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hedge me in. I am a soldier, I. Older in practice, abler than yourself to make conditions. Go to. You are not Cassius. I am. I say you are not. Urge me no more. I shall forget myself. Have mind upon your health. Tempt me no further. <laughs> Away, slight man. Is it possible? Hear me, for I will speak. Must I give way and room to your rash collar? Shall I be frighted when a madman stares? Oh, gods, ye gods, must I endure all this? All this? Aye, more. Fret till your proud heart break. Go show your slaves how choleric you are, and make your bondmen tremble. Must I budge? Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humour? By the gods, you shall digest the venom of your spleen, though it do split you. For from this day forth I'll use you for my mirth, yea, for my laughter when you are waspish. It come to this. You say you are a better soldier. Let it appear so. Make your vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For mine own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me every way. You wrong me, Brutus! I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say better? If you did, I care not. When Caesar lived, he durst not thus have moved me. Peace, peace! You durst not so have tempted him. I durst not. No! What, durst not tempt him? For your life, you durst not! Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that I shall be sorry for. You have done that you should be sorry for! There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as the idle wind which I respect not. I did send to you for certain sums of gold which you denied me, for I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send to you for gold to pay my legions which you denied me. Was that done like Cassius? Should I have answered Caius Cassius so? When Marcus Brutus grows so covetous to lock such rascal counters from his friends, be ready, gods, with all your thunderbolts, dash him to pieces. I denied you not. You did! I did not! He was but a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus hath rived my heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities. But Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not, till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. A friendly I could never see such faults. A flatterers would not, though they do appear as huge as high Olympus. Come, Antony, and young Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius, for Cassius is a weary of the world, hated by one he loves, braved by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, set in a notebook, learned and conned by rote, to cast into my teeth. Oh, I could weep my spirit from mine eyes. There is my dagger, and here my naked breast, within a heart dearer than Pluto's mine, richer than gold. If that thou beest a Roman, take it forth. I, that denied thee gold, will give my heart. Strike as thou didst at Caesar, for I know when thou didst hate him worse, thou lovedst him better than ever thou lovedst Cassius. Sheathe your dagger. Be angry when you will. It shall have scope. Do what you will. Dishonor shall be humor. Oh, Cassius, you are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire, who much enforced shows a hasty spark, and straight is cold again. Hath Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him? When I spoke that, I was ill-tempered too. Do you confess so much? Give me your hand. And my heart, too. Oh. Brutus. What's the matter? 
Have you not love enough to bear with me when that rash humor which my mother gave me makes me forgetful? <laughs> yes, Cassius. And from henceforth, when you are over-earnest with your Brutus, he'll think your mother chides and leave you so. Let me go in to see the generals. There is some grudge between them. Tis not meet they be alone. You shall not come to them. Nothing but death shall stay me. How now, what's the matter? For shame, you generals, what do you mean? Love and be friends as two such men should be. For I have seen more years, I'm sure, than ye. Oh. <laughs> How vilely doth this cynic rhyme. Get you hence, sirrah. Saucy fellow, hence. Oh, bear with him, Brutus, tis his fashion. <laughs> I'll know his humour when he knows his time. What should the wars do with these jigging fools? Companion, hence. Away, away, be gone. Lucilius and Titinius, bid the commanders prepare to lodge their companies tonight. And come yourselves, and bring Masala with you immediately to us. Lucius, a bowl of wine. I did not think you could have been so angry. Oh, Cassius, I am sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to accidental evils. No man bears sorrow better. Portia is dead. Oh. Portia? She is dead. How escaped I killing when I crossed you so? Oh, insupportable and touching loss. Upon what sickness? Impatient of my absence and grief that young Octavius with Mark Antony have made themselves so strong. For with her death that tidings came. With this she fell distract and... Her attendants absent, swallowed fire. And died so? Even so. Oh, ye immortal gods. Speak no more of her. Give me a bowl of wine. In this I bury all unkindness, Cassius. My heart is thirsty for that noble pledge. Fill Lucius till the wine or swell the cup. I cannot drink too much of Brutus' love. Come in, Titinius. Welcome, good Masala. Now sit we close about this taper here and call in question our necessities. Portia, art thou gone? No more, I pray you. Masala, I have here received letters that young Octavius and Mark Antony come down upon us with a mighty power, bending their expedition toward Philippi. Myself have letters of the self-same tenure. With what addition? That by prescription and bills of outlawry, Octavius, Antony, and Lepidus have put to death an hundred senators. Therein our letters do not well agree. Mine speak of seventy senators that died by their prescriptions, Cicero being one. Cicero one. Cicero is dead, and by that order of prescription. Had you your letters from your wife, my lord? No, Masala. Nor nothing in your letters writ of her? Nothing, Masala. That, methinks, is strange. Why ask you? Hear you aught of her in yours? No, my lord. Now, as you are a Roman, tell me true. Then, like a Roman, bear the truth I tell. For certain, she is dead, and by strange manner. Why... Farewell, Portia. We must die, Masala. With meditating that she must die once, I have the patience to endure it now. Even so great men, great losses should endure. I have as much of this in art as you, but yet my nature could not bear it so. Well, to our work alive. What do you think of marching to Philippi presently? I do not think it good. Your reason? This it is. It is better that the enemy seek us, so shall he waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offence, whilst we, lying still, are full of rest, defence and nimbleness. Good reasons must of force give place to better. The people twixt Philippi and this ground do stand but in a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy, marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up, come on refreshed, new added and encouraged. 
from which advantage shall we cut him off if at Philippi we do face him there? These people at our back. Hear me, good brother. Under your pardon, you must note beside that we have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brimful, our cause is ripe. The enemy increaseth every day. We at the height are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. Then, with your will, go on. We're along ourselves and meet them at Philippi. The deep of night is crept upon our talk, and nature must obey necessity, which we will niggard with a little rest. There is no more to say? No more. Good night. Early tomorrow will we rise and hence. Lucius, my gown. Farewell, good Masala. Good night, Titinius. Noble, noble Cassius. Good night and good repose. Oh, my dear brother, this was an ill beginning of the night. Never come such division between our souls. Let it not, Brutus. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night, good brother. Good, good night, night, lord Brutus. Farewell, everyone. Give me the gown. Where is thy instrument? Uh, here in the tent. What? Thou speakst drowsily. Poor knave, I blame thee not. Thou art all watched. Call Claudius and some other of my men. I'll have them sleep on cushions in my tent. Varro and Claudius. Calls, my lord? I pray you, sirs, lie in my tent and sleep. It may be I shall raise you by and by on business to my brother Cassius. So please you, we will stand and watch your pleasure. I will not have it so. Lie down, good sirs. It may be I shall otherwise bethink me. Look, Lucius, here's the book I sought for so. I put it in the pocket of my gown. I was sure your lordship did not give it me. Bear with me, good boy. I am much forgetful. Canst thou hold up thy heavy eyes a while and touch thy instrument a strain or two? Aye, my lord, and it please you. It does, my boy. I trouble thee too much, but thou art willing. It is my duty, sir. I should not urge thy duty past thy might. I know young bloods look for a time of rest. I have slept, my lord, already. It was well done, and thou shalt sleep again. I will not hold thee long. If I do live, I will be good to thee. This is a sleepy tune. Oh, murderous slumber. Layest thou thy leaden mace upon my boy that plays thee music? Gentle knave. Good night. I will not do thee so much wrong to wake thee. <laughs> if thou dost nod, thou breakst thy instrument. I'll take it from thee. And good boy, good night. <sighs> let me see, let me see. Is not the leaf turned down where I left reading? Here it is, I think. How ill this taper burns. Wow. Who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes upon me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makes my blood cold and my hair to stare? Speak to me what thou art. 
Why, evil spirit, Brutus? Why comest thou? To tell thee thou shalt see me at Philippi. Well, then I shall see thee again? I at Philippi. Why? I will see thee at Philippi, then. Now I had taken heart, thou vanishest. Ill spirit, I would hold more talk with thee. Boy, Lucius, mm. Varro, Claudius, sirs, awake. Claudius. The strings, my lord, of force. Oh, he thinks he still is at his instrument. Lucius, awake. My lord? Didst thou dream, Lucius, that thou so criedst out? My lord, I do not know that I did cry. Yes, that thou didst. Didst thou see anything? Nothing, my lord. Sleep again, Lucius. Sirra, Claudius, fellow thou, awake! My lord? My lord? Why did you so cry out, sirs, in your sleep? Did we, my lord? Aye. Saw you anything? No, my lord, I saw nothing. Nor I, my lord. Go and commend me to my brother Cassius. Bid him set on his powers betimes before, and we will follow. It shall be done, my lord. Our hopes are answered. You said the enemy would not come down, but keep the hills and upper regions. It proves not so. Their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us at Philippi here, answering before we do demand of them. Tut! I am in their bosoms, and I know wherefore they do it. They could be content to visit other places and come down with fearful bravery, thinking by this face to fasten in our thoughts that they have courage, but tis not so. Prepare you, generals. The enemy comes on in gallant show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out, and something to be done immediately. Octavius, lead your battle softly on upon the left hand of the even field. Upon the right hand, I keep thou the left. Why do you cross me in this exigent? I do not cross you, but I will do so. They stand and would have parley. Stand fast, Titinius. We must out and talk. Mark Antony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Caesar, we will answer on their charge. Make forth. The generals would have some words. Stir not until the signal. Words before blows, is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better as you do. Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, Long live, hail Caesar. Antony, the posture of your blows are yet unknown, but for your words, they rob the Hybler bees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless, too. Oh, yes, and soundless, too. For you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Villains! You did not so when your vile daggers hacked one another in the sides of Caesar. You showed your teeth like apes and fawned like hounds, and bowed like bondmen kissing Caesar's feet, whilst damned Casca, like a cur behind, struck Caesar on the neck. Oh, you flatterers. Flatterers. Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today if Cassius might have ruled. Come, come, the cause. If arguing make us sweat, the proof of it will turn to redder drops. Look. I draw a sword against conspirators. When think you that the sword goes up again? Never! Till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged, or till another Caesar have added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands unless thou bringst them with thee. So I hope. I was not born to die on Brutus' sword. Oh, if thou wert the noblest of thy strain, young man, thou couldst not die more honorable. A peevish schoolboy, worthless of such honor, joined with a masker and a reveler. <laughs> Old Cassius still. Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have stomachs. Why now? 
now blow wind. Swell below and swim bark. The storm is up and all is on the hazard. Oh, Lucilius, hark a word with you. My lord? Masala. What says my general? Masala, this is my birthday. As this very day was Cassius born. Give me thy hand, Masala. Be thou my witness that against my will, as Pompey was, am I compelled to set upon one battle all our liberties. You know that I hold Epicurus strong in his opinion. Now I change my mind and partly credit things that do presage. Coming from Sardis, on our former ensign, two mighty eagles fell. And there they perched, gorging and feeding from our soldiers' hands, who to Philippi here consorted us. This morning are they fled away and gone, and in their steads do ravens, crows, and kites fly o'er our heads, and downward look on us as we were sickly prey. Their shadows seem a canopy most fatal, under which our army lies, ready to give up the ghost. Believe not so. I but believe it partly, for I am fresh of spirit and resolved to meet all perils very constantly. Even so, Lucilius. Now, most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly that we may, lovers in peace, lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, let's reason with the worst that may befall. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time we shall speak together? What are you then determined to do? Even by the rule of that philosophy by which I did blame Cato for the death which he did give himself, I know not how, but I do find it cowardly and vile for fear of what might fall so to prevent the time of life, arming myself with patience to stay the providence of some high powers that govern us below. Then if we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome. No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end that work the Ides of March begun, and whether we shall meet again I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again... Why? We shall smile. If not, why then this party was well made. Forever and forever farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, it is true this parting was well made. Why then, lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. But it sufficeth that the day will end, and then the end is known. Come home. Away. sign here of mine was turning back. I slew the coward and did take it from him. Oh, Cassius, Brutus gave the word too early, who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil, whilst we by Antony are all enclosed. Fly further off, my lord, fly further off. Mark Antony is in your tents, my lord. Fly, therefore, noble Cassius, fly far off. This hill is far enough. Look, look, Titinius. Are those my tents where I perceive the fire? They are, my lord. Titinius, if thou lovest me, mount thou my horse and hide thy spurs in him till he have brought thee up to yonder troops and here again, that I may rest assured whether yon troops are friend or enemy. I will be here again, even with a thought. Go, Pindarus, get higher on that hill, 
my sight was of a thick. Regard to Tinius, and tell me what thou noticed about the field. My lord. This day I breathed first. Time is come round, and where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run his compass. Sir, what news? Oh, my lord! What news? Titinius is enclosed round about with horsemen that make to him on the spur. Yet he spurs on. Now they are almost on him. Now, Titinius! Now, some light! Oh, he lights too! He's king! And hark, they shout for joy! Come down! Behold no more. Oh, coward that I am to live so long to see my best friend ta'en before my face. Come hither, sirrah. In Parthia did I take thee prisoner, and then I swore thee, saving of thy life, that whatsoever I did bid thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come now, keep thine oath. Now be a free man, and with this good sword that ran through Caesar's bowels, search this bosom. Stand not to answer. Here, take thou the hilt, and when my face is covered, as tis now, Guide thou the sword. <coughs> Caesar, thou art revenged, even with the sword that killed thee. <coughs> so I am free, yet would not so have been, durst I have done my will. O oh, Cassius. Far from this country, Pindarus shall run, when never Roman shall take note of him. It is but changed, Titinius, for Octavius is overthrown by noble Brutus' power, as Cassius' legions are by Antony. These tidings will well comfort Cassius. Where did you leave him? All disconsolate with Pindarus his bondman on this hill. Is not that he that lies upon the ground? <gasps> he lies not like the living. Oh, my heart. Is not that he? No, this was he, Masala. But Cassius is no more. O oh, setting sun. As in thy red rays thou dost sink tonight, so in his red blood Cassius' day is set. The sun of Rome is set. Our day is gone. Clouds, dews, and dangers come. Our deeds are done. Mistrust of my success hath done this deed. Mistrust of good success hath done this deed. Oh, hateful error, melancholy's child. Why dost thou show to the apt thoughts of men the things that are not? Oh, error, soon conceived, thou never comest unto a happy birth, but killedst the mother that engendered thee. What, Pindarus? Where art thou, Pindarus? Seek him, Titinius, whilst I go to meet the noble Brutus, thrusting this report into his ears. I may say, thrusting it, for piercing steel and darts envenomed shall be as welcome to the ears of Brutus as tidings of this sight. Hi, you, Masala, and I will seek for Pindarus the while. Why dost thou send me forth, brave Cassius? Did I not meet thy friends, and did not they put on my brows this wreath of victory, and bid me give it thee? Didst thou not hear their shouts? Alas, thou hast misconstrued everything. But hold thee, take this garland on thy brow. Thy Brutus bid me give it thee and I will do his bidding. Brutus, come apace, and see how I regarded Caius Cassius. By your leave, gods, this is a Roman's part. Come, Cassius' sword, and find Titinius. Where, Masala, doth his body lie? Lo, yonder, and Titinius mourning it. Titinius' face is upward. <gasps> he is slain. 
Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Brave Titinius. Look where he have not crowned dead Cassius. Are yet two Romans living such as these? The last of all the Romans. Fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Come, therefore. And to Thassos sent his body. His funeral shall not be in our camp, lest it discomfort us. Lucilius, come and come. Young Cato, let us to the field. Labio and Flavius set our battles on. It is three o'clock, and Romans, yet ere night we shall try fortune in a second fight. is safe enough. I dare assure thee that no enemy shall ever take alive the noble Brutus. The gods defend him from so great a shame. When you do find him, or alive or dead, he will be found like Brutus, like himself. This is not Brutus, friend, but I assure you a prize no less in worth. Keep this man safe. Give him all kindness. I had rather have such men my friends than enemies. Go on and see where Brutus be alive or dead, and bring us word unto Octavius' tent how everything is chanced. Come, poor remains of friends. Rest on this rock. Statilius showed the torchlight, but my lord, he came not back. He is or tame or slain. Sit thee down, Clytus. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in fashion. Hark thee, Clytus. What? I, my lord, no, not for all the world. Peace then, no words. I'd rather kill myself. Hark thee, Dardanius. Shall I do such a deed? Oh, Dardanius. Oh, Clytus. What ill request did Brutus make to thee? To kill him, Clytus. Look, he meditates. Now is that noble vessel full of grief that it runs over even at his eyes. Come hither, good Volumnius, list a word. What says my lord? Why this, Volumnius? The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night, at Sardis once, and this last night here in Philippi Fields. I know my hour is come. Not so, my lord. Nay, I am sure it is, Volumnius. Thou seest the world, Volumnius, how it goes. Our enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy to leap in ourselves than tarry till they push us. Good Volumnius, thou knowest that we two went to school together. Even for that our love of old, I pray thee, hold thou my sword hilts whilst I run on it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly, fly, my lord. There is no tarrying here. Farewell to you. And you. And you, Volumnius. Strato. Thou hast been all this while asleep. 
farewell to thee too, Strato. Countrymen, my heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So fare you well at once, for Brutus' tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes. My bones would rest that have but labored to attain this hour. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence, I will follow. I prithee, Strato, stay there by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of a good respect. Thy life hath had some smatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword, and turn away thy face while I do run upon it. Wilt thou, Strato? Give me your hand first. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good Strato. Caesar, now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. man is that? My master's man. Strato, where is thy master? Free from the bondage you are in, Masala. The conquerors can but make a fire of him. For Brutus only overcame himself, and no man else hath honor by his death. So Brutus should be found. I thank thee, Brutus, that thou hast proved Lucilius' saying true. All that serve Brutus, I will entertain them. Fellow, wilt thou bestow thy time with me? Aye, if Masala will prefer me to you. Do so, good Masala. How died my master, Strato? I held the sword, and he did run on it. Octavius, then take him to follow thee, that did the latest service to my master. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general, honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, This was a man. According to his virtue, let us use him, with all respect and rites of burial. Within my tent his bones tonight shall lie most like a soldier, ordered honorably. So call the field to rest. Let's away to part the glories of this happy day. In Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare, Michael Feast played Julius Caesar, John Bow, Brutus. Adrian Lester, Mark Antony, Geoffrey Whitehead, Cassius, and Estelle Cola, Portia. Jonathan Taffler played Octavius Caesar and Metellus, Keith Drinkle, Casca and Dardanius, Nicholas Murchie, Lucilius, Popilius, and the Carpenter, Will Keane, Marillus, and Masala, Paul Goodwin, Artemidorus, Clytus, and the Cobbler, David King, Soothsayer and Second Soldier, Sean Baker, Sinner and Pindarus, Chris Pavlo, Lucius and Strato, Gerard Logan, Young Cato and the Poet, John Dalimore, Cicero, Sinner the Poet, Volumnius and Publius, Bill Homewood, Flavius, Titinius and Caius Ligarius, Shirley Dixon, Calpurnia, Scott Cherry, Decius and Varro, and Theo Fraser Steele, Trebonius and Lepidus. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The musicians were Melinda Maxwell on Cor Anglais, 
Jocelyn Pook, Viola, Sean Bell and Tim Gill, Shelley, Dominic Lejean, guitar, Alan Brown, double bass, Philip Eastop and Raul Diaz, French horns, Roberto Salvatore, Aris Nadirian, Ronald Sam and Paolo da Silva, vocals, Andrew Martin, Dave Tosh and Chris Brannock, percussion. The music was composed and conducted by Dominique Legendre. Julius Caesar was directed by Clive Brill.